day. I'm Jane Morris and today I'm going to talk about how we can manage to delay the emergence of insect resistance to Bt crops. There are a number of other presentations where I've discussed risk assessment of Bt crops and in those I have alluded to the need to put measures in place to delay or prevent the development of resistance. So I'm going to give you a little bit more detail today in how we might go about that. In this presentation I'll talk about how big a problem is resistance and how does it arise, what strategies are available to delay resistance development, how do non-BT plant refuges work and what's the future for pyramided BT genes. GM crops are now widespread globally covering over 180 million hectares and of this area around a third is planted to BT crops but with this success comes an increasing risk that sustained exposure to BT will result in the development of resistant insect pests and in fact this is already happening. A number of mechanisms whereby insect resistance can occur have been identified. These include mutations in cadherin the receptor for the Bt protein that is found in the microvilli of the insect midgut cells. Mutations in midgut proteases that subsequently oligomerize the Bt protein. And then mutations in secondary receptors that bind the oligomers into the lipid raft membrane, forming pores that kill the insect cells. Mutations in ATP binding cassette transporter proteins mutations in the synthesis of glycolipids in the lipid raft membrane and production of a gut esterase that sequesters the Bt toxin. So you can see there are quite a wide range of options that the insects have to develop resistance and in addition to these there are some instances of resistance where the mechanism is not yet known. As I said already field resistance is already becoming a problem and reduced efficacy in the field has already been noticed for at least five insect species. This includes identified resistance in maize stalk borers in South Africa. The problem is that unless proactive screening for resistant insects is carried out, the emergence of resistance may only be identified once a product has failed repeatedly and by that time it's generally too late to respond effectively. A variety of strategies have been proposed over the years to manage the development of resistance. I should stress that these are all means to try and delay the onset of resistance rather than to prevent it altogether. One option is the use of mixtures, mosaics or rotations of transgenic plants. So this can include mixtures of transgenic and conventional plants or rotating crops with different Bt genes. Then another option is time or tissue specific toxin expression so that the pests are not continually exposed to the Bt toxin. In practice this is difficult to implement effectively since scientists have limited means at their disposal to ensure that the toxin is expressed when and where it is needed. A third option is the use of low toxin doses in combination with natural enemies so using Bt as one component of an integrated pest management strategy. In practice, unfortunately, the main proponents of IPM are organic farmers who reject the use of GM crops. Another option is the use of high expression of the Bt toxin in combination with refugia of non-Bt plants. And up to now, this has been the most favored strategy and I'll talk about it in more detail. Then more recently, co-expression of different Bt genes in a single plant has been introduced. This is known as pyramiding and again I'll discuss it in more detail in this talk. So let's look further at the strategy of having insect refuges with non-Bt plants. How do these work? Well, the theory is that rare resistant insect pests are likely to mate with abundant susceptible pests from nearby refuges. If inheritance of resistance is recessive, the progeny will be susceptible. And even if they're not completely susceptible, by linking the refuge strategy with high toxin doses, it should be possible to ensure that individuals heterozygous for resistance are killed. 
Let's look at the high toxin dose strategy in more detail. We can start by assuming that a high dose is at least 25 times the dose required to kill 99% of individuals that are homozygous for the sensitive phenotype. Assuming that the resistance trait is recessive, any surviving moths will be homozygous for the resistant phenotype. Those few survivors will then mate with the much higher numbers of sensitive moths that emerge from the non-BT refugia, giving rise to heterozygous RS offspring. These larvae will then be killed when they feed on the high-dose BT plants. Unfortunately, this strategy is not foolproof. For a start, it assumes that inheritance of the resistance gene is recessive, which is not necessarily true. In fact, it's recently been shown that in the case of the resistance in the maize stalk borers in South Africa, inheritance is actually a dominant characteristic. The strategy also assumes that resistant insects will be rare and will almost always mate with susceptible wild types. This again is not always true, as shown by one case where evidence has been found for asynchronous development in a BT resistant population of pink bollworm, so that the resistant and susceptible populations will not emerge at the same time. Another problem is that depending on the placement of the refuge and on the dispersal characteristics of the insects, dispersal may not be sufficient to ensure that the resistant insects mate with susceptible wild types. Yet more problems arise when the high dose criterion is not met, which in practice is not uncommon for a number of insects. This, in combination with the fact that refugia are often implemented inconsistently, is a major cause of resistance development and is thought to have contributed to the development of resistant maize stalk borers in South Africa. In Africa, in the smallholder farming environment, implementation of refugia is particularly difficult. But even on larger scale commercial farms, the spatial location of refugia and the insect management in those refugia may not be optimal. So how should refugia be best managed? Well, the conventional approach is to require a 20% refuge that can be sprayed with insecticide or a 5% unsprayed refuge. However, computer modelling would suggest that this is the bare minimum and much better results would be obtained from a 20% unsprayed refuge. Modelling of different patterns for the refuge shows that a border pattern works best, as shown here, whereas mixtures or mosaics are least effective. Rotation of the BT crop with non-BT crops can help to delay the emergence of resistance. However, the common practice of spraying the refugia with non-BT insecticides significantly reduces the efficacy and in fact it's probably better to have a smaller unsprayed refuge than a larger sprayed one. A 5% unsprayed refuge is likely to be more effective than a 20% sprayed refuge. However, many of the recommendations for refugia are based on computer modelling since it's difficult to generate real experimental data. The computer models make certain assumptions about the insects and about the nature of the resistance to BT, which may not always hold true. One problem is that not enough is known about the dispersal and mating patterns of some insects to guide the refuge placement requirements. Another problem that's been identified is that farmers tend to selectively irrigate the BT crop at the expense of the refuge crop. The insects tend to prefer to colonise the irrigated crop so that there are fewer insects in the refuge. Yet another problem is that the BT crop is often contaminated by up to 3% of non-expressing off types and this in itself can accelerate resistance development. Because of some of the problems with refugia, more and more BT crops are now becoming available with pyramided BT genes. Combining BT genes with different modes of action is an effective way to delay resistance as the insects need to simultaneously develop resistance to both genes. It's been shown that pyramiding genes within a single product is more effective than alternating insecticidal products or sequential use of different products, i.e. switching to a new product once one becomes ineffective. 
but problems arise if plants expressing a single gene are grown in the same area as two transgene plants. This can give the insects a chance to develop resistance to one gene before moving on to the two transgene crop. So concurrent use of two transgene plants and plants expressing either gene singly will select for resistance more rapidly than using the pyramided Bt plants alone. Pyramiding Bt genes doesn't do away entirely with the need for refugia, but it may allow for a reduction in the refuge size. From this graph, you can see that the number of generations until resistance emerges is very much higher for pyramided genes with a 20% refuge than for the single gene crop. Some companies such as Monsanto are advocating the use of pyramided Bt crops mixed with 5% non-Bt plants to avoid problems of non-compliance with refuge requirements. This is not an ideal solution for some pests as inter-plant movement by larvae would render it less effective. And in any case, it's very questionable whether 5% non-Bt seeds in the mix is sufficient. The problem with a mixture is that larvae may avoid feeding on Bt plants or larvae developing on non-Bt plants may move to toxic plants and die, reducing the effective size of the refuge. It's worth taking a look at what Australia has done to manage resistance to Bt, as this may pose some useful lessons for Southern African countries. Australia has proactively put in place a stringent regime for resistance management in the Bt cotton crop. They realised from the start that Bt cotton expressing the Cry1AC gene did not meet the high dose criterion for activity against the cotton bollworm Helicoverpa armigera and they were worried about the rapid emergence of resistance. As long as only the single gene crop was available, that is up to the year 2003, no farmer was allowed to plant more than 30% Bt cotton. Since 2003, when two transgene varieties became available, only these are allowed to be planted rather than the single gene varieties. The smallest refuge option is 5% pigeon pea, which must be unsprayed and irrigated. Other alternatives are 10% unsprayed and irrigated cotton, or a sprayed cotton refuge that is the same size as the area of Bt cotton. In addition, routine genetic screening for field resistance is carried out in order to pick up any resistance at an early stage. These measures have paid off as Australia has encountered far fewer problems with resistance in contrast to the US where resistance to the related Helicoverpa zea is becoming a real problem. So to end with a few take home messages. Firstly, insect resistance will quickly become a problem unless preventative steps are taken from the start. Farmers need to be educated on the importance of refugia and compliance monitoring needs to be put in place. And thirdly, a screening program for resistant insects also needs to be put in place. If this is done, there's no reason why Bt crops should not be successful in controlling insect pests for many years to come. Finally, I give you here a few recommendations for further reading. Obviously, this is just a small selection of the available literature, but it may help to further explain some of the issues I've dealt with in this presentation. Thank you.